Hi, uh, welcome to the Global Day of Protest Against War on Iran. I'm Morgana, I'm a member of Peace Action Maine. I'm on the board. Um, we're here calling for no war in Iran. We don't think that military action leads to security and we as a country need to focus our energy and our resources on building a more equitable society and preventing climate change in the United States. Um, I know I sometimes feel overwhelmed at the ubiquity of the military industrial complex here and the number of wars that we're involved in and events like this are really important because they allow us to come together and see that we are not alone in our desire for a more peaceful and just world. Um, the first speaker we have is Angus Ferguson. He's a draft resistor from the First Parish Peace Community and he's going to talk about a challenge for each one of us. So, um, as we just heard, my name is Angus Ferguson, um, and First Parish UU Church is in sight right over here, and um, I have a couple of magic words for you. Um, hot chocolate. <laughs> so, if after we're done uh, here, if you'd like to follow me down there, um, we have some snacks and so forth and a chance to talk more. Um, uh, on the Sunday after um, President Bonespurs assassinated General Suliani, uh, about 40 members of our congregation stayed after the Sunday service uh, to discuss this uh, troubling development. And a few days later, we were here in Monument Square um, doing what we're doing today. Uh, my theme essentially is that we must break the silence. Break the silence, as you know, is the, was a, a theme of uh, Martin Luther King's famous Beyond Vietnam speech. Uh, that was the speech in which he talked about the fierce urgency of now. He also said, we're at a moment in our lives we're at, a, we're at a moment when our lives must be placed on the line if our nation is to survive its folly. He went on, our only hope today lies in our ability to recapture the revolutionary spirit and declare eternal hostility to poverty, racism, and war. In 1967, I was a, a long-haired college student I went on to resist the draft to protest against that war that we lost in Vietnam with thousands of dead Americans and almost a million dead Vietnamese and billions of dollars wasted. And now I'm here with uh, not quite so much hair and a little longer in the tooth. Um, and otherwise things are frighteningly the same. It's sort of deja vu all over again uh, and again. Our war in Southeast Asia spread to genocide in Cambodia. Within my lifetime then Iran Contra under Reagan was more lies and part of U.S. actions that are still bringing refugees to our borders. Uh, it's now become as one uh, former Pentagon employee said that wartime is the only time. Lies started and strung out that war in Southeast Asia. Lies about WMD, weapons of mass destruction, and mission accomplished. Got us into Iraq and kept us there. The historian Barbara Touchman talks about how lies, deception, are a weapon of war. You have sneak attacks, you have ambushes misinformation about your troop strength and your battle plans. And that's easily turned into propaganda on the home front. Propaganda that keeps up patriotic support for the war and quells the kind of protest we're here providing today. And then ditto for Afghanistan. You, you probably heard the recent Washington Post expose on the lies that have uh, maintained our war in Afghanistan. And finally, um, the assassination of General Soleimani. Uh, Donald Trump finally even gave up on the idea that it was 
imminently needed to prevent uh, some kind of uh, uh, attack on, on our embassies. So again, I, I, we must break the silence. Our leaders lie, millions die, billions gets wasted. So I'm, I'm glad to see the people who are here. You give me hope. Um, I'm always afraid that, that the words we try to speak here are sort of like dust in the wind. But as a, a poet, I, uh, a poet, uh, a copying a poet that I heard recently, uh, talk is cheap, but silence is unaffordable. Thank you, Angus. Um, our next speaker is Lance Tapley. He's a political and investigative columnist for the Free Press of Camden, Rockland. Uh, he recently published an article that you might have seen about the Senate candidates and the war with Iran. Thank you. I am an activist journalist, and uh, my role here today is to give you an, an activist report. I'm a reporter. Uh, and um, can you hear me all right? I'm, I may, I'm an activist journalist. I'm going to give you an activist report that includes uh, being fast uh, in giving you this report because the material that I'm going to cover uh, is quite lengthy in the newspaper that I work for, the Free Press. If you go to Free Press Online, you can read the whole thing. Um, and I was asked to be here because I'm, I understand that you folks this year, or Peace Action Maine, is emphasizing uh, electoral activism. This is, of course, an election year. So I've been asked to explain, and that's what my article does, how the, the Senate candidates feel, the U.S. Senate, Senate candidates feel about uh, war with uh, Iran. And I'm going to speak here a little bit, very quickly, in shorthand, um, and I may not get every nuance, but if, as, if you go to the website, you will see uh, what uh, the nuances, if there are some, uh, some candidates don't have really have many nuances, are. Um, uh, so I focused, yeah, I, I focused on uh, Susan Collins and the Democratic uh, uh, candidates in the primary for the Democrats and the Green Independent candidate uh, Lisa Savage, who is here today. Uh, the, the Democrats are Sarah Gideon. She's sort of the establishment, the well-funded moderate uh, Democrat, uh, so-called. Betsy Sweet, a well-known uh, progressive candidate who ran for governor. Uh, Bree Kidman, uh, who is less well-known, but also quite progressive. And a new um, a candidate, uh, Ross Lajeunesse, uh, who is an ex-Google executive. Uh, he, is, he is new, he is unknown. He doesn't come across to me as very progressive. Um, okay, these are the questions I asked and the answers I got, and I'm just going to, as I say, speak in shorthand. Uh, the big one is, do you think it was a good thing for President Trump to kill uh, General Soleimani? And uh, basically their answers were, Collins thought it was okay. Uh, Gideon, a uh, Democratic frontrunner, uh, answered directly, but seemed to think that he deserved to die. Lajeunesse uh, Soleimani deserved to die was the, the basic message, but uh, he was opposed to the re reckless ex escalation of military activities with, uh, with Iran. Uh, Betsy Sweet, uh, Bree Kidman, Lisa Savage, Lisa again, the Green, who's here, uh, it was not okay. Uh, to kill uh, this man. Um, and um, the second question was, do you believe the president had the legal authority under U.S. or international law to do that? Um, uh, and uh, before I give you the answers, I might just point out that already has been mentioned that this was an assassination. And not all news media are, are calling it that. I noticed yesterday the BBC was calling it an assass assassination. Now, you should be, understand that an assassination is a type of murder. I looked it up this morning uh, in Webster, murder by sudden or secret attack, often for political reasons. So it's very clear what happened. And I also think about, I want to point out, uh, I, uh, there were nine other people killed in this attack. We don't know who those people are, basically. They were aides, guards, perhaps. We don't know anything about them as human beings. But they were nine human beings who were killed by this, by this strike, which is generally said to only kill 
uh, General Soleimani. Um, Collins answered the question of, about legal authority. Uh, yes, he had the authority to protect Americans from attack. Gideon and La Jeunesse uh, didn't give a direct answer, but they, uh, they don't want to go further into war without tr uh, congressional approval. Uh, sweet, Kidman, Savage, no legal authority. Third question, how would you answer the, the question asked by former Navy, Navy Secretary and U.S. Senator Jim Webb in a Washington Post opinion piece, when did it become acceptable to kill a top leader of a country we aren't even at war with? Uh, Collins, Gideon, La Jeunesse didn't answer the question. Uh, Kidman and Savage said it was unacceptable. Uh, Bessie Sweet said she regretted that it had become acceptable to too many people after 9-11. Uh, and then uh, for this next question, I didn't ask about the Cain Bill because, the, the, you know, the Cain Bill is, is pre accepted, as I mentioned, by, by Collins and King already. I asked about uh, the Bernie Sanders bill, which is a joint resolution, Senate Joint Resolution 3159. This is a stronger bill. It prohibits money being spent for unauthorized uh, military action. And so the question was, do you support uh, or oppose the, this, uh, this bill, which also, uh, among others, uh, Senator Elizabeth Warren is supporting, and it's called the No War Against Iran Act. Collins, Gideon, uh, said in answer to whether they supported the Bernie Sanders bill uh, that they support the Cain bill. Lachaness didn't answer the question. Uh, Sweet, Kidman, and Savage, yes, they support the, the, the Bernie Warren bill, the No War Against Iran bill. Um, I uh, will skip over the next question, which is, did you support a, a House bill that would also limit uh, Trump's action? Uh, uh, because the, the answers were very similar to the answers about the Senate. Uh, and then finally I asked, what U.S. interests in the Mideast do you believe require U.S. military action or the U.S. military presence? Uh, Collins, our interests are preventing Iran aggression, fighting ISIS, and protecting shipping lanes, which I think means oil. Uh, Gideon and La Jeunesse didn't answer again. Uh, Kidman, they, they gave statements. They didn't answer the questions uh, point by point. They just gave rather uh, brief statements to me. Um, Kidman, uh, we should have a careful disengagement from the Middle East. Sweet, bring the military home. And Savage answered most uh, clearly and plainly, we don't have interests there. None was her answer. Um, so those are, those are the questions and the answers. And uh, I want to add just a little bit about recommendations uh, that I have for, for the peace movement in, in Maine, uh, uh, now that we know about the Cain, the Cain Bill. Uh, number one, you can see where Susan Collins is. So probably uh, I've already in my columns come out and said Susan Collins needs to be defeated. Uh, working to defeat Collins, uh, Collins is, is by far, I think, the top priority. Second, support uh, an anti-war candidate. And third, you could try to get Collins and, and uh, King to support the Sanders bill. I'm not sure how far along uh, you will get on that, but it, it might be worth it. And then uh, finally, you could get the legislature, possibly, to pass a bill expressing sentiment against the war. Uh, it would not have any legal effect, but you would definitely uh, get some publicity out of that. So those are some suggestions. Okay, well, I'll be just over here for a bit in, in case you have any questions. Thank you. Thank you. Um, our next speaker is Jess Falero. They're a member of Extinction Rebellion, and they're going to be talking a little bit about that. The sad truth is this. Our politicians have so much, so much experience that they no longer listen to reason. The people in power feel that they know so much that they will no longer listen to their constituents. They will no longer take the voice of the people before they make decisions for the people. At a time when a majority of the country is struggling to put food on their table, at a time when over 500,000 Americans are experiencing homelessness, at a time when the climate crisis 
is upon us and it's threatening our future generations. Our politicians refuse to listen to reason. Our leaders refuse to listen to the truth and refuse to stand up for us. I, for one, will not stand here silent while all of these things are happening. I will not stand here in the corner and refuse to lift my voice against these atrocities. I absolutely refuse to sit here like a lump when our people are suffering. Every one of us needs to rise up in solidarity just like we are today, standing in Monument Square against this decision that was made by our leader without our consent. This protest does not end here. This fight for liberty and life does not end here. This fight for a better world does not end here. It continues with each of us as we continue about our lives. It continues in everything that we do. It continues in every decision that we make and every interaction we have. The time is now. We are the people that we have been waiting for. Thank you. Um, our next speaker is Andrew Favreau. He's a husband and father. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm gonna echo some of the comments that have been made already, um, talking about how we got here and some of the reasons that, that I am here today, and I think a lot of you are as well. And you know, as, as Angus talked about, we've been lied to, and it's a pattern. It's a pattern that's been going on for decades. Um, the Af Afghan papers were released by the Washington Post last month talking about syst uh, systematic lying about what was happening in, in Afghanistan. We, you know, we, we supposedly invaded Afghanistan because of Osama bin Laden and al-Qaeda. They quickly fled. The mission quickly morphed into an endless war with the Taliban and the citizens of Afghanistan who, re who didn't want to live under U.S. military rule. Osama bin Laden was supported by the U.S. in the 80s in the war in Afghanistan against the Soviet Union. And before that, the U.S. goaded the Soviet Union into that war in Afghanistan by supporting factions in Afghanistan that were in opposition to the Soviet Union. Bush Sr. lied about babies in incubators being removed from incubators. That was justification to go to war with Iraq in the first Gulf War. That was, that was a lie. They killed over 100,000 Iraqis in that war as they bombed in a massive bombing campaign and took out infrastructure as well as much of the military of Iraq. Bill Clinton instituted an embargo that led to deaths of hundreds of thousands of Iraqis. Madeleine Albright told Diane Sawyer that it was worth it. That's psychotic. Bush Jr. lied to us about WNDs in, June, in, in Iraq leading to an invasion that cost trillions of dollars and got over a million Iraqis killed in the chaos that followed. We've been bombing and intervening in Iraq for 30, or for 30 years. The average age in Iraq is 20. In America, it's 38. It's a direct result of all that chaos that we have been a, that the United States has been a very big part of that entire time. And that was after helping Saddam Hussein come into power because he was in opposition to what was happening with people that wanted to be, wanted to nationalize the oil in Iraq and be more in line with the Soviet Union. They, they, we supported Saddam Hussein after the Iranian, Iranian Revolution, which was after the U.S. supported a dictator in Iran, the Shah, for two decades, which was after the U.S ousted the, Iranian, the democratically elected leader of Iran in the 50s. This is a pattern that just keeps going on and on. So why? Why does administration after administration continue the same pattern? The pattern is about money, resources, power, and empire. It is systemic. It's institutional. It's cultural. We have to break it. We have to change the way we treat things. 
The U.S. has a long history of supporting dictators, authoritarians, and thugs while overthrowing governments deemed too far to the left. Any country that wants to nationalize their natural resources or share that wealth with its own people instantly becomes the United States, an enemy of the United States government and money interests who the individuals and institutions of the D.C. Ultimate, ultimately serve. Some of the most resource-rich countries, regions, and countries in the world have some of the poorest people and are often the most unstable. It's not by accident or coincidence. So we're here today around, and around the country and around the world to call for an end to this cycle. To call, this is a call to action. We must get informed, stay informed, and stay active. We must protest and make our voices heard. We must talk with our friends, relatives, neighbors in order to grow our numbers. We must contact our legislators, whether they be Democratic, Republican, Independent, or otherwise, and demand an end to the U.S. wars of regression. We must vote in primaries and general elections for candidates in, committed to diplomacy and ending endless war. We must demand an end to U.S. interventions that create unnecessary hardship and death. We must demand our tax dollars and countless hours of human capital be repurposed towards activities that add value and true security to our lives. Peace does not come at the point of a gun or a drone bomb. Peace and prosperity come from mutual cooperation and shared benefit. Let's imagine that world. Thank you. Thank you. Um, our last speaker will be Bob Jones. He'll be talking about activism with love. Good afternoon. Could have been a little warmer, a little sunnier, but we got what we got, right? So uh, I was a very angry anti-war activist after 9-11. Um, I hated the government, um, was very frustrated about progress, and um, I, I just I couldn't stop being frustrated and angry, and um, I found my friends started to avoid me. They didn't want to hear it. You know, it was just like, go away. You've said that a hundred times, but you're not doing any good. So eventually I dropped out of being an activist. Um, <clears throat> but then I, a little later, I decided that maybe I could do it a different way. Maybe I could change my attitude. So this is about me changing my attitude and see if some of this might help with you. I got inspiration from Gandhi. Um, one of his favorite sayings, as we all know, is we need to be the change we want to see in the world. So I was trying to change the world, save the world, but I really hadn't looked inside. And I wondered, you know, could I change inside? Could I change my attitude? And would that help me with activism? So here are three practices that I finally adopted uh, that were basically words of wisdom from Gandhi and King. One is to practice love. Uh, Martin Luther King Jr. led the fight against racism and for civil rights with great love. He said, I'm convinced that love is the most durable power in the world. Love is an absolute necessity for survival of our civilization. To return hate for hate does nothing but intensify the existence of evil in the universe. We need to radiate love to each other, not hate and fear. Code Pink also echoes some of that same language in their literature. I believe they say we need to act out of radical love. Do we have any Code Pink fans or people here? Yay, all right. <laughs> um, the second thing is to practice compassion and kindness for everyone, for all life, for all sentient beings. And the third is to practice being more peaceful. That seems like it would be easy, but uh, I was not being peaceful at all. Gandhi said, there's no path to peace. Peace is the path. And it took me a while to get my mind around that. I think we really want peace, or we say we want peace, but I question, do we really? I mean, there's a lot of violence in America, and in Americans, we're attracted to violence. If you don't believe that, do a search on Netflix for movies and count how many of those movies are violent. I eventually decided to stop watching violent movies because it was, it was messing with my head. 
Uh, and I learned, I basically needed to learn to be more peaceful over time and try to radiate that sense of peace to others. One of the challenges I find is to hold a view of the world being peaceful. You know, in a country that has endless wars, it's pretty hard to get that into our mindset, but we have to do it. So to me, there's real power in these practices. Those in charge want us to be afraid. They want to separate us, pit us against each other. But if we are full of love, have peaceful intentions, and are fearless, they can't stop us. They can't hurt us. That's why we have to keep going uh, with that attitude in mind, at least for myself. Buckminster Fuller said, you never change things by fighting the existing reality. You need to, to change something, you need to build a new model. Uh, makes the existing model obsolete. So maybe this is a new model for us to follow. Can we turn things around? Can we end the endless wars? Nobody knows that. But we have to make the effort to change things if we want a viable future for our children, for all children. I'll end with Margaret Mead's quote that most of you are familiar with. Never doubt that a small group of thoughtful, committed citizens can change the world. Indeed, it's the only thing that ever has. Now this, this is a medium-sized group, but there's a lot of us out there. We're global citizens, and there's, there's a lot of citizens in the world that want peace. People in Iran want peace. So um, you gotta figure, we outnumber those in power, what, 100,000 to one? Something like that. So we are powerful beings, and we can achieve peace together. Let's do it. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you. Um, our final speaker is Richard Clement from Veterans for Peace. He's going to be saying a few words for you. Hello. Uh, I was just asked to speak, so I have uh, nothing prepared, so I'll make this short. Uh, I've been a veteran for peace since 2003, 17 years. Uh, Veteran for Peace started here in Maine in 1985. So I encourage people to find an affinity group, somebody they can join with, somebody that instead of just being an individual coming out here today, join with somebody who is really doing something to make a difference in our future. I joined uh, Veterans for Peace in 2003, and our son went to Iraq in 2004 and came back in 2005 and got out. So he's been out and away from Iraq for 15 years. And I thought about it on the way down here this morning, driving down here, kids have grown up, gone to school, they're going to college, and they've known nothing but war in their lifetime. Right. We need to change that. We need to stop our endless wars. Thank you. Thank you. Um, thanks everyone for coming out today and sticking it out through the cold. Um Okay, thank you all, and we're going to have an open mic for a couple minutes until um, so people who have something to say can still say it, and then we're going to be lining Congress Street with our signs and capture as many haunts as we can before we close. And Angus, are you going to, did you invite? And I also want to remind you of the magic words, hot chocolate. That's it. We'll be having a... a snacks and restrooms and other things at First Parish Church, which is just down Congress Street um, on, your, on your left, less than a block. Um, and so uh, come join us. It'll be a chance not only to get warm, but to talk about how we carry this forward. By pure coincidence, January 8th, I was in Normandy, just saying it makes me cry. I looked at those crosses and I couldn't 
believe, even though I know about Normandy, I know the story, I know everything. And standing there looking at those fields of crosses and some of the Jewish symbol, the Jewish star, and I said, how can anybody ever want a war again? Well, I want to thank Peace Action Maine and Peace Works of Greater Brunswick and the other organizations, uh, Veterans for Peace, that helped organize today. I'm Lisa Savage. I'm running for the U.S. Senate seat of Susan Collins as a Green under ranked choice voting. Um, thank you. Uh, you can sign my ballot access petitions over there where we're tabling, but really I'm here to tell you that I've been out here in Monument Square for years now protesting various wars that were about to start or were underway or never seemed to end the current threats to Iran and the people of Iran by the administration in Washington are very alarming. We already have Iran under sanctions, which stop life-saving medications from reaching uh, people in Iran that need it. Uh, we've already unilaterally withdrawn from the uh, nuclear non-proliferation treaty that Iran entered into with us. There's no evidence that they did not uphold their end of the bargain, yet the current administration in Washington just decided we weren't in that deal anymore. And then comes, in that context, comes the assassination of an Iranian uh, leader who was in Iraq, so it's an act of war against both Iraq and Iran at that point. And uh, we're, what we're hearing is was in Iran, I mean was in Iraq representing Iran in uh, peace negotiations and uh, talks about how to reduce the violence and the conflicts that uh, the U.S. and NATO basically created in Iraq and that the Iraqi people are living with to this very day. So I've been against this war for years now because we've had many threats of attack on Iran. Uh, currently, it's heated up again. Um, why do we have so many wars that never end? Well, uh, the chief export of the United States is weapons and violence. So endless war is basically a marketing scheme that helps General Dynamics and Boeing and all the many, many, many wealthy corporations that sell their weapons uh, to uh, the Pentagon at to the taxpayers' uh, expense. And the biggest thing of all that they will always tell you is, well, we have to have all these bombs and all this military and all your congressional reps in Maine, all four of them just voted for the biggest spent, uh, Pentagon bill ever. Uh, and they will tell you because it's for security. Well, I think many of you here with us today understand that the greatest threat to security that any of us are facing is climate catastrophe. It is already underway. The Pentagon is the biggest carbon polluting organization on the planet. Its greenhouse gas emissions exceed that of 140 nations, yet we continue bombing and building bombs while ignoring the fact that it's climate change that we should really be addressing urgently. That's why I'm for a Green New Deal converting our weapons factories to building something that we need, like solar power, uh, like uh, commuter rail, like offshore wind, and stop building things that make the climate crisis worse. Start building something with our tax dollars that make you know that offer solutions to the crisis and the emergency that we're in. I feel like younger people are looking at my generation and going, "What part of emergency do you guys not understand? This is urgent. It's right now." So uh, that's why I'm running. Thank you for listening and thank you for being here. Hi, my name is Palmer Ryan, and following Lisa was rather timely because I'm announcing that on Thursday from 6 to 7.30, we're going to have a planetary meeting for um, direct action regarding our oil tanks, the ships that are going through, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And it's at 100 State Street, which is the senior citizen building, the apartment building on uh, State Street. It's a high rise. And we have an auditorium downstairs, and a gentleman by the name of Jay O'Hara uh, from the uh, Climate Disobedience Center is going to be facilitating the meeting. So we consider it to be kind of long term. It's a, it's a launching, it's an opportunity to really get involved. There's all kinds of needs 
from food to uh, media to, um, you know, et cetera, et cetera. So if anybody wants to hear more about it, I have a few more. I printed out 10 emails, and I guess I have one or two left. But if you come up to me, I can give you more details. And it is also multi-generational. And so a lot of the people, it's an offshoot of the people that have been protesting around the uh, coal mine in New Hampshire, where civil disobedience has taken place. Thank you. I want to introduce myself. My name's Ayumi. I'm a transgender um, woman of color. Um, it's very sad for me to sit back and hear everything that's going on. And like just said, I'm not going to sit silent through this. You know, I've always wanted to speak on things like this, but I just haven't had the motivation to do it because of, you know, my own personal struggles and seeing what others are going through and figuring out how can I help? Well, I think I've already done everybody a huge favor by standing here right now saying that. Because I mean, let's just be honest, let's just be honest. I haven't really had the best life, but let's be honest, I'm only 24, I got plenty of years left. Instead of sitting on my butt, playing video games all day, why don't I do something that gives back to these people? Because I was, I'm ex-homeless, but it can always change. And I will do anything in my part to help anybody out um, I'm just really excited to be here, and thank you guys so much for your love and support. I appreciate it. Yeah. Hi there. My name is Austin Witham. I'm 22 years old, and I have never not known a time when this country was not at war. It, sorry, when this country was at war. The point is, the more I learn about the conflicts that we've been involved in, the less and less justified it becomes. And it's disgusting to me that I was told time and time again as a kid that we are the good guys. We are fighting for something that matters. Well, money and resources do not matter when you are putting people's lives at risk and making children fear blue skies. There is no excuse, no justification that I could be given now for these conflicts. It is time to stop, to put aside the military industrial complex and work towards a sustainable future. Thank you guys for your time. Thank you for being here. So I'm going to go uh, make sure the coffee's hot. And uh, so, uh, like I say, everybody's welcome down at First Parish. It's just a half block uh, uh, down Congress Street. Um, and we'd love to see you there and uh, have me a chance to share uh, more. I just want to say real quick that the assassination of Soleimani has been a unifying, and, and also there was a, I don't remember his name, but there was a, lead, a military leader from Iraq who was also assassinated at the same time. It's been a unifying event for the people of Iran and Iraq. Uh, millions were out in the streets uh, for Soleimani, and and just this week, it's not really being covered by the U.S. media. Hundreds of thousands were out in the streets uh, in Iraq, demanding that the U.S. well, an end to U.S. aggression and that the U.S. leave Iraq. So it's time for us to say that that we hear you, we hear you, right? And we need to put an end to this. So thanks for coming out, everybody. Hi everyone. <laughs> you know me. I'm the millennial who in middle school sat in a lockdown school in my classroom watching as the Twin Towers burned and fell. You know me. I'm the millennial who in high school was constantly visited by military recruiters telling me that to save our country required the sacrifice of our lives. The millennials. You know me. I'm the millennial who joined the war effort, thinking that I was doing my country proud. You know me. 
I'm the Navy vet who served on the Carl Vinson when we helped SEAL Team 6 kill Osama bin Laden. You know me. I'm the millennial who watched as others my age died fighting in sand so far away. You know me. I am the veteran who can't hold down a job because I'm too best up in the head now. You know me. I'm 30 years old now. We're not children anymore. But no one pays us any more attention. You know me. Because we, the millennials, will one day have to <laughs> have to make up for the mistakes and sins of our fathers. You know me. Out here, you know, it doesn't feel like there's a lot of us here, but you know, Maine's a small community, so if anybody shows up, I think it's a big deal. Um, you know, especially as everybody's kind of becoming a little more politically awake, because we're kind of realizing that it kind of matters who's in power, who imposes these kind of rules on us, and who decides what we do every day. We kind of are coming up with ideas about things we want to see change in the world, like, oh, other countries have awesome commuter rail systems. Universal healthcare has been a thing all over the world, except for here. You know, how are, and you know, the number one question on the other cross, oh, how are we going to pay for any of this stuff? This last year, the Pentagon was $37 trillion over the budget, the most it's ever been. And every year they just keep upping the budget and spending whatever they want and writing it off on the American taxpayer because they can. Nobody stopped them and they'll keep on doing it. Next year it'll be even bigger and we'll take over all the countries in the world if we can. We have a thousand military bases all over the world. What is that funding? but destruction and death all over the world and making us poor and dying over here. If we want any solution, we have way more in common with the people we're bombing in Iraq and Iran than anywhere else in the world. We have, we're bombing in Somalia, we're bombing all over the world, and we don't even talk about it. Special forces just got killed in like the middle of, of Africa, in like the Congo. Does anyone know that we have troops in the Congo? You know, it's, it's insane. Like, we have troops all over the world, we're spending all this money, and people over here are dying in the streets and we're not doing anything about it because the Pentagon is just sucking up all our resources and money. You know, I can't even imagine what this country would look like if we actually had our tax dollars that we've been spending on the past 30 years and all these ridiculous wars overseas. We haven't fought a justified war since World War II. It's just unimaginable. So, you know, it may seem like there's not a lot of people here or anything compared to what's going on everywhere else on Saturday night, but just, you know, the FBI and the CIA They've worked really hard to make sure the anti-war movement in this country is nothing like it was in the 60s. They spent a lot of our tax dollars to make sure that we weren't organizing or getting together or trying to figure out how we can do stuff like this. So this is the groundwork. This is really where it's at. I just want to thank everybody, all the organizers and everybody else who's here.